Yeah, well, I'm uh, actually a trans woman of about uh, 25 years seniority, but uh, I'm almost two years off my 90th birthday. Uh, my story uh, started in England where I was born and raised, and uh, I went to school, I guess, around 1930. But prior to that, I had a I got my introduction, or my message from nature, if you like, on this whole subject of what became known to me about 20 years later as uh, transsexualism, um, from a dream that I had. Now, I had no exposure of any, dis any nature to anything that had the remotest connection with this. I was a child of four or five years of age, and uh, I had this strange dream which uh, didn't really frighten me, but it disturbed me. And um, in it, I saw a girl with blonde hair and a dress. And I had no knowledge of anything to do with sex at that time. And uh, I looked in the mirror, and it was me. I thought to myself, I, I just couldn't connect this situation together, how I could be a little boy in bed dreaming and yet I've got this strange apparition in my head and you know that dream has left an imprint on my brain which is, exists to this day I can remember it in virtually every detail I wanted to uh, I, I, naturally I suppose I discussed most things with my mother and uh, I tried to tell her a bit about this and uh, she said oh my god don't tell your dad. He'll have you locked up. And of course, my father's favorite threat was if we misbehaved, um, doing anything a bit screwy, he would uh, threaten to send us to the uh, nearby asylum. We called it in those days the lunatic asylum. It was a big red brick institution about a mile long outside the town of Chester. And uh, it was a frightening place to look at and uh, it never appealed to me after that threat to be locked up on a lunatic asylum. And you know, that, that one remark really killed any idea that I had that I could talk about this thing. It became a secret. It was um, accompanied by fear. I did fear my father, not that he was a bad father, but I did fear him. Anyhow, <sighs> I carried my secret with me for, would you believe, for 62 years altogether. And when I was 62 years of age, I, uh, I phoned up to the bank of a general hospital one day. My second marriage had broken up, and uh, I felt now or never. And uh, I said, Can I, uh, do you have a sex change clinic? And she said, well, yes, we do, but we don't call it that. It's the gender dysphoria clinic. So she put me through to it. And uh, anyhow, I'll go into a bit of detail on that later. But the other thing that I, I experienced was I was not a cross, like, I dreamt about cross dressing as a child, but I didn't do anything about it until one day I was sitting in the family room in our home, and my mother was working in the kitchen. And I noticed a pair of shoes of hers. They were moderate high heel shoes and I slept them on. I thought, oh my God, these fit, they could, I could walk around with these. So I got out of them as quickly as I could. I didn't want to be discovered, but I thought, well, I've got to do something about this. I'm going to cross dress. The first opportunity I have, I want to do this because I knew that I was growing like a weed at that age. Mm -hmm. And um, this was my opportunity to cross dress for the first time, which I did. And I did that on a number of occasions when there was nobody in the house and I, had, I was alone and uh, circumstances were all okay. Uh, I was never discovered. I was an expert on hiding the evidence. And um, then uh, along, there was a long interlude uh, when I reached the age of 17 and a half, I joined the British Navy in 1943, 
and um, there was absolutely no opportunity to do anything like that in wartime on warships with an old male crew and all the rest of it. <laughs> the, um, if they had if, if they found they had a pansy on board, they would have, have probably done all sorts of desperate things to me. That was at least a thought that went through my head. But in any event, um, I uh, joined the Navy and uh, I became a, uh, started as an ordinary seaman, became a midshipman and then jumped to the rank of sub-lieutenant and ended up as a lieutenant in the R&BR after four years of naval service. Because most of us coming back from the war at that time, uh, we were thinking in terms of settling down, having a finding a, a wife or the, we weren't already married or having children and all the all the other good things and that because that's exactly what happened. So I I married at the age of twenty three and my wife was twenty four at the time and uh, we lived a very normal middle class um, type of life in uh, in England before coming to Canada in 1952 where we carried <laughs> on. Unfortunately, uh, as all, with all things, marriages aren't always made to last and that marriage ended when, after 26 years and uh, I found another bride and uh, we had another marriage for another 14 years. So I had 40 years of marriage and at the end of it all I thought, oh, Jesus, this is, this is like coming out of prison for a I suddenly felt released. I thought I've got to do something about this. This is—I couldn't see myself getting married for a third time. It was just stupid. Either, either I could not make the right choice, or I couldn't behave in the manner that was expected of me, or whatever it might have been. But uh, so I decided at that point that was when I was going to deal with my gender dysphoria, which had been present all along, and uh, but completely hidden. Uh, I did have one or two opportunities uh, when we were married to go to what we call fancy dress parties, uh, New Year's Eve type things, and uh, or Halloween and so forth. And that was a, a great experience because that was the only time I let the I let the genie out of the bottle. And the second time around, uh, when I went to one of those, I went to the trouble of getting a dress made specially that fitted me properly, and uh, all the other stuff that went with it. And of course, my, my wife went dressed as a kitchen maid or something like that. She had pounds hanging around her waist and they rattled. And she was madder than hell because I looked a hell of a sight better than she did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, I don't know what the hell gets into you. What, what, what is it that's about you that makes you want to do this? I said, well, I'm a, I, I said, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. <coughs> I said, when they, when they do anything, I, I want to do it properly. So if I'm going to go as a woman, I want to look like one. Uh, rather a funny experience, though, on that particular occasion, but really, uh, God, my wife knows. We were walking out at the end of the evening, and there was um, everybody was a bit giddy with booze and all the rest of it. And suddenly this woman ran her hand up my skirt and grabbed my genitals and Gave my good squeeze and said, "God, it's a it's a man. I thought you were a woman all along." And because my wife uh, really was ticked off at that, <laughs> 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 so I got a good lecture on the way home. I said, "She said you you should do something about it." And I said, "Well, I I'd like to, but I can't." I she said, "Why?" I said, well, I don't want to go getting up all the doctors, and I don't want him uh, to uh, desert you or anything like that. But I don't want to sort of give up on the kids that are at a critical time in life and all the rest of it. So it was back to the drawing board. And uh, anyhow, jumping ahead a little bit, when I went into the clinic, uh, I found them to be a pretty good crowd, with Dr. Diane Watson and uh, Dr. Uh, Oh, what was his name? Um, Oliver Robino, uh, quite, quite well known, I think, in gender circles, and uh, I think a team of about six people all together. And uh, things went famously uh, until they had a social worker who ran a Thursday afternoon drop in until one day I said, uh, I think, you know, I said, I think I'd like to keep notes of uh, 
what goes on here. I'd like to write a book one day about my experiences. Oh, God, she was, uh, she really flew off the handle. She said, I want to see you after this meeting's over. So I went into her office and she said, uh, we don't have any room here for all years of one sort or another. Uh, she said, uh, we are very, very, we have to operate with some degree of secrecy because the, the uh, government has cut back on this. We have the Van der Zand government at that time and they were very anti anything like this. So uh, I said, well, I'm not a voyeur. And I said, uh, I'm dealing with my own private life. I'm, I'm talking about my, my own situation. And of course, but this is all circumstantial. Anyhow, she, she, she barred me from the clinic for about six weeks. And then when I had an appointment with Dr. Watson, Dr. Watson said, why haven't we been attending the meetings? So I told her. And uh, we, uh, uh, I went back and went to the clinic and uh, the Thursday afternoon meetings and so forth, and everything went fine. But one of the things which, which leads me onto the Zenith Foundation is we found that the clinic was very, very deficient in written material. Uh, you know, various degrees of intelligence are displayed by various people. We were by and large a fairly intelligent group of people, I think, that attended that clinic at that time. And uh, the, the fact that there was this deficiency bothered me a great deal. And uh, being a, a writer, I've been writing for some years in any event for shipping and fisheries magazines and so on, uh, I thought that, you know, something needed to be done to correct it. So, as long as short it was, we did have a meeting that went on every other Wednesday called the Wednesday Night Meeting, which was um, run in uh, Dr. Angela Wensley's private home. And we decided at that time that we had to get on to a more formal basis. So, um, three of us, Dr. Oh, no, uh, yeah, uh, Pat Dewald, who was a clinical psychologist, joined us, and uh, Christine Burnham, the late Christine Burnham, who was a well-known trans figure around these parts, and myself, we got together and decided to form what became the Zenith Foundation. And we had extraordinary success. It was amazing how quickly that grew. Um, we started a little newsletter off called the Zenith Digest and we started to circulate that. Our collegial relationship with the clinic through Pat, Pat D. Old, was such that they came to like and trust what we did. So quite a few of our members came to it via the clinic. And um, we did uh, a lot of good work. And uh, just to give you some idea of what we did, uh, we um, uh, I was the first president, by the way, for the first six years, and uh, we had a lot of political issues at that time, both the government, uh, the medical health plan, and of course people who were coming out of the woodwork who had been police and uh, different professions of one sort or another. We had one guy who had been a town planner, <coughs> and uh, the great medical of a regional district, and uh, people of that ilk and um, stature and uh, they all were looking for support and uh, the clinic did what did a very good job in the sense that they, the doctors were there and they were available but they didn't really do a very good job in terms of the sort of after the after uh, the, the non-medical stuff put it that way so anyhow we started off to do <coughs> pamphlets and um, the, um, we always took the precaution, though, of running them past the clinic before we published them. And we did about eight or ten pamphlets to do with employment, um, <coughs> children of transsexuals, and did one which, which was really almost a forecast, and which is, leads us up to the present day, uh, on child transsexuals. Now, <coughs> we've had three exposures over about ten years to... Uh, peripherally to child transsexuals and uh, it seemed that it was a very, it was almost treated as a kind of a traveling curiosity of some sort. 
And uh, <coughs> this pamphlet of ours actually was a forerunner. And uh, so we, uh, I wish to stop passing these notes. Uh, they're, they're, they're throwing me off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got two minutes. <coughs> Anyhow, you have more if you want. Hey? You have more time if you want. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we should noted that, that that when we closed the Zenith Foundation down in 2003, which followed on the closing down of the clinic, the Bank of the General Hospital, and the succession, the successor organization became Bank of, Bank of the Coastal Health, who set up the trans gender health program, which was a referral type of thing, somewhat based upon the lines of the Ingersoll Clinic in, <coughs> in Seattle. Um, so we thought, well, our usefulness is over, and we, we wound her up, and that was it. Uh, the last president was um, Gail Roberts, and Gail and I sort of became the custodians or whatever there was left of the Zenith. And uh, it was actually a big mistake. We should have stayed in business. Uh, there was a role for us which became a pound later on. These, the, you know, the, the hospitals can only do so much. Hospital clinics are limited. They're not business people or anything like that. They're medical people, that's their limitation. Um, the uh, Bank of the Coastal Health became a gigantic that has become a gigantic bureaucracy. And I think bureaucracies tend to collapse eventually under their own weight. The transgender uh, health program got into difficulties, and um, then there was a severe rallying that went on with the advisory group, which I was a member of, and uh, Gail was the chairperson of it. <coughs> and uh, eventually the the uh, coastal health people decided to close it down. So that was the last interface between the bureaucracy and the public, because we represented that interface. And uh, so they brought out this transgender health information program. I don't know how it's going to work, but it's pretty limited compared to the old one. So I said to Gail, I said, uh, I think we should, this is the moment when we should re-establish the Zenith Foundation. This was about November of last year, and we knew that Lucas Walter, who had been an extremely capable presenter, and, uh, uh, on, but had been very restricted by uh, the, the Transgender Health Program, was looking for a new birth, and he really needed a corporate sponsor of some sort. So that, that is what has brought about the we established the Zenith Foundation. Uh, we were now incorporate. We, we we took the old trans. We took the old Zender Digest Publishing Society, <coughs> which we formed to re-establish the Zenith the Zenith Digest. But as a freestanding uh, newsletter or, or magazine, it didn't really float. So we re we renamed it the Zenith Foundation, and we're now in business and. Um, uh, I think the future looks good. There's been a huge upsurge in the number of children who are coming forward uh, in BC here. Uh, the, um, uh, our focus is on children and families, and particularly parents and so forth. <coughs> a, lot of people, a lot of parents have been more difficult than their children are in dealing with this. <laughs> so uh, that's our main focus for the time being, and as time goes on, we hope to expand it into other areas. But we've, we've taken the precaution this time, though, of having some doctors on board right from the beginning. So we've got three doctors who are all we, they're called <coughs> clinical consultants in this, but there are uh, the other part of the team, in effect. Now, <coughs> um, I've got a, a, a number of these. This was a temporary thing put together, basically for this conference, but um, also because we needed a, we needed something when we're talking to bankers and accountants and people like that, uh, which which sums up our situation to date. And uh, <clears throat> if anybody wants a copy, they're over there at that table, the white box. And I don't have enough to go around, but uh, help yourselves by all means. 
Uh, and that's basically the story of myself and the, the re-establishment of the Zender, the Zender Foundation, which gives me something to do in my late retirement and uh, hopefully it will be probably my last serious business endeavor. So there we are. Thank you very much.